Um, welcome back, everyone. Um, with just about 10 seconds to go, I'll introduce the next team. This is Pedro uh, Barreto, Michael Wagner, and Miguel de Barros for the reference architecture. Um, I'll take it away. Thanks, Simeon. Hi, everyone. So I'm here to present the, um, the update on the reference architecture and the V2 build. Um, the agenda that we have for today is we're going to start with what we've been working on. Um, we will then talk about the reference architecture and documentation. We'll go into a bit of a refresher of what the reference architecture is and its benefits. Um, towards the end, we'll talk about the marketplace vision um, and, and how to enable it. And then we'll end the presentation as we've been ending the previous presentations, asking for help. So during this PI, um, what we've been working on, and I'm going to start by what, um, so, so, sorry, this is the work that we've been doing um, throughout the reference architecture work stream. And this has spanned multiple PIs already. We started by identifying all of the problems that Modulope is solving and we made sure that we had a firm understanding of what those problems are. And, and that's the problem space that we mapped and, and, and had a, a good comprehension of. Then we designed a high level view of how to best solve those problems and a view of how to solve those problems in, in, in conjunction in, in a way that the solution of all of those things is a, is a fairly cohesive solution until we were happy with the overall design. And that's, the solution space. With those two parts fully understood and mapped out, we started dedicated sessions about the specific different parts of the solution, the, the use case details, and also the common areas like the security, the logging, and the configuration management. At that stage, we produced the initial version of the reference architecture. And after that, we started documenting it. Um, for this BI, um, we had planned to start building the foundation of this new design of this version two. Unfortunately, we didn't have resources for that. So we continued iterating and detailing specific parts of the solution, but most of our time um, was, was spent towards the documentation side of things, making sure that the work that we have done gets published in the easiest possible way so that people can understand it and can, can, can see its value. Um, and with that, um, I invite Michael, who's been fundamental in this documentation effort, to walk us through the documentation process. Um, Michael, please. Hey, everyone. Um, it's nice to be here, and it's good to meet you all, um, although you're rather far away, I guess. But anyway, we all are. So, yeah, um, I think that to begin with, let's just review the working docs that we've been using. So we've used a number of different tools in order to, to put our plans for the documentation together and to plan the reference architecture. Um, starting with Mirrorboard, which we've used to outline all of our BCs um, and the UCs that form part of the, form part of the BCs. So obviously the use, UCs are use cases, BCs are bounded contexts, and I'm sure you all know that. So that's where we've done all of our flow, flow diagrams and, um, and planning around what needs to happen and how it needs to happen through, throughout, um, throughout the, the switch that we are busy designing. Um, we've used Google Docs for additional documentation, just spare notes and things like that, just little snippets that we've, we haven't um, included in the mirror board um, and to ensure that we, um, we don't forget things and that we can include things into the, in, the, in the official documentation that we release um, or the published documentation, let's put it that way. And we've also used Google Sheets for outlining things like the interfaces that are used, um, where they're used and, and how they're used and so on. So having said that, um, I want to take you through the beginnings of our, um, of our published document. So um, I want to, just uh, give you a bit of a rundown on that. Um, we're, we're using ViewPress, and the reason that we have decided to use ViewPress for the for the document for the for the published documentation is because we um, 
wanted to align with the next release of documentation for Mojo Loop, which is going to be released soon. Um, and so we want to be in alignment with that. So we've used Loopress. Our effort is still um, in um, a work in progress, but we have got a number of, of um, things that are completed and that I'm just going to take you through. So um, Pedro, if you could just go to the, um, uh, go to the document, that's great. So just in terms of the introduction that gives a, an idea of the how and the why and the what of, of Merge Loop, um, how it fits together, what the process of, of, of uh, or the thought process has been behind um, the reference architecture too. Um, and, uh, and so that's where you'll find that information. Um, if we could just pop to the first page, which is the, um, which is the quoting agreements. And I'll just take you through the structure of the page and the layout. <laughs> and so Pedro, can you go there? Thanks. Cool. So um, basically each bounded context is being split into different components. So we've, we've included an introduction, a common terms, a functional overview, which is basically a flow diagram. And then we've gone into use cases and we have notes and references if required at the bottom of the document. Um, each UC contains the, um, um, a description and a flow diagram showing how it all fits together. And then as you can see in this particular um, um, BC, uh, UC, we've got BC rather, we've got the canonical model at the bottom along with some additional notes. Um, so that's how we've designed the documentation in order to make it very easy to, to, um, to find what you're looking for and to gain the information that you need in order to understand and also to see the layout of interfaces in the various UCs and things like that, where they're used and how they're used and so on. Um, if we could just pop to the next page, which is a quote, uh, which is the third party API. I just thought we'd show you that because it's been quite an extensive um, uh, um, BC that we've worked on. Um, um, it's quite large. Um, it comprises two scenarios, which you can see um, is the linking scenarios, which we're going through now. And then at the bottom of the, or the, the lower half of the document, we've got the, um, we've got the transfer scenarios and you can also use um, jump keys. So we've put jump keys into the document so that you can move around and navigate around the document really easily. Okay. Um, and then the last thing that I wanted to show you was the interfaces page, which is very different to the rest of the, um, of the document. So the interfaces page basically shows where each interface has been used um, and what it's been used for. Um, so there's a, there's a, there's a description um, and also the um, details of the BC from which it is uh, originating and the um, BC to which it's going. Um, and, of, and, and the description, obviously, and, I, and, and each place where it's been used. And some of them, as you can see, are not, uh, not unique. They are used um, in um, various places. So, yeah. Okay. So, um, that's my story, I guess. If anyone's got any questions, please launch them in my direction or Pedro's direction. We'll try to help you. Thanks, Michael. So... This link will be shared. Um, um, it's part of the it's part of the presentation, and and we will share it um, with everyone. So let me get back to the presentation. So apologies for this. So this is I, one thing is important to mention about the reference architecture documentation, and and that is that this is a living document. It's it's not something that we been creating in an ivory tower and then will will be static forever the point of having a reference architecture is to make it a living document um, and to refresh what a reference architecture is and apologies for those that have been seen this have seen this already but we do believe this this is an important message we're going to go through um, a few slides mentioning or explaining what exactly reference architecture is and what is the fundamentals and why do we need one and in, in, in the simplest form, a reference architecture is, is, a, is a set of documents that capture what the product does, what the product is, and also allow us to 
by incorporating the principles, in our case, Modulo's principles and design principles guide the implementation, so the code, the way, the design, the architecture of its future versions. So ideally, reference architecture is what good looks like, is what is the target state that we would like to achieve in terms of technology, in terms of architecture design, in terms of um, um, how we assemble our solution together. And to unpack a bit of what that actually means, uh, Miguel will now walk us through the details of what this is, the principles that guide it, and what are these the benefits. Miguel, take it away. Uh, sorry, Pedro, can I ask a quick question? Yes. So the previous uh, slide, please just go back, please. Yes. So you mentioned providing guidance to the implementation. That is a design, not an architecture. There's a slight differentiation between architecture and design. Perhaps we can have a more detailed discussion, but I think that's mixing up two concepts. It is, well, that, that is an interesting discussion, the difference between design and architecture. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm sure we, we, we would love to have that discussion. This is design. This is, um, well, so that we don't go into that discussion right now. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say what we think design and architecture is in, in this case. Um, and, and this is something that Miguel will cover in the next few slides. Essentially, is the right level of detail in terms of architectural design and principles without going into the detail of how it should be implemented into the code, into the, the details that are not valuable at the level of the reference architecture. Our intention is to keep the reference architecture um, um, always at the level where it has a lot of value and it, it allows the implementation to vary. It allows the implementation to change details, to change technicalities and still deliver the values that we think need to be there by design. So the, the whole thing needs to look in a certain way, needs to deliver some benefits and, and adhere to some principles. And, and, and for that, we must respect those high level principles. And, and Miguel is gonna go through some of these examples. It's gonna make it a lot clearer. Sure. Um, thanks, Pedro. Um, uh, sorry, I think I'm, I'll start from the next slide, Pedro. Apologies. I think this okay, was yours. So, well, uh, well, actually, that, 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 that's an interesting one. It's, it's the answering your question, the, what we have in terms of reference architecture is something that it stays at the level where it identifies the abstractions, um, the interfaces and the standardization opportunities. And um, what, what that means is that it, it, it allows us to have a common way of dealing with common problems. It defines the interfaces between the different discrete parts of the system without dictating how the parts do and, and solve their problems inside. It proposes those common patterns and solutions. It all it helps enforcing technical design principles, things like to, to, to achieve better scalability, we need to decouple things. We need to use asynchronous communications. Um, technical design principles, for example, are the way we do security. Those, those are non-negotiables. Those are things that we must abide by and, and must be part of our principles. It also provides guidance to the actual implementation architecture. And I think this is where the answer to your question is. When we go into the actual coding of a solution that looks like this design, the reference architecture tells you what are the boundaries? How, how do things need to be? Um, and, and where is the line that allows you for, to, to, to have different implementation architectures that still adhere to the reference architecture design, to the, to the to reference that we're providing? It also- I think it's gonna depend on the architecture framework you're taking. For example, you mentioned Prograph, it has different layers of architecture. And of course, the design is at a lower level. You think mm -hmm. about subs that has contextual, conceptual, logical, physical, and different layers of architecture. So I think maybe I can help offline to, to add a bit more structure as to how you segregate architecture from design. Because those are slightly different things. Yes, yes, you're right. And that, that, that was going to be very interesting. We, we do have some time at the end of this, um, at this, at this um, I think it's Thursday, we have some time 
for those discussions. So I would love to, to have your view on that. Thank you. Okay, good, good point, good contribution. So at, at the end, what, what we're saying is that we need to foster innovation and contribution. And, and, and this is essential. It's not as easy as it seems, but by defining what can be done and how, and what are the parts that are, let's call them non-negotiable and part of the structure, and what are the parts that are flexible and can depend on um, different details of the implementation, we are making it very explicitly that uh, parts can change, other parts cannot change, how those parts can change, and, and this sets a very clear environment for partners to, to provide, to contribute, and everyone to be able to contribute to the modular environment. So, sorry, this is where Miguel helps us understand the, the principles. Yeah, as, as you said, I mean, the reference architecture is in, es in essence a blueprint, and as such, there needs to be some agreed principles so we can actually... Uh, design and, and evolve Mojulu, as it were. So a reference architecture must be detailed enough to have value. And this is kind of what you were discussing earlier, Pedro, but not too detailed or specific to limit the actual implementation. Um, as such, we have, a, we have agreed to use the bounded contexts as the right level of abstraction. This also takes into consideration the single responsibility principle and the decoupling of the core subsystems. As such, the most important aspect of the design is to identify the interfaces and the interactions, i.e. the use cases between the bounded contexts. By having the well-defined and stable interfaces, we achieve that uh, uh, decoupling that um, Pedro previously mentioned, which enables us to evolve the parts independently and even replace them if needed. And we'll see a bit more about that a bit later when we start talking about marketplaces. But as per our original design principles, the communication between the parts of the platform should be mainly asynchronous and event-driven. We have also agreed that some of the communication paths, which are potentially less critical or don't require a high degree of parallelism can be implemented in an RPC or a, a standard REST style. Of course, a reference architecture must also propose mechanisms to ensure the platform is secure, performant at scale, cost-effective, modular and extensible, resilient, testable, um, easy to deploy and operate. Um, all of these sound obvious, but as we all know, it's really easy to negatively affect one or more of these others without these guiding principles. Thus, we should always have these principles in mind as we design and evolve Moduli. Um, and this also comes back to uh, uh, the documentation that Michael showed. It is a living document. It is going to evolve. It is going to change. Um, and hopefully these guiding principles is going to be the thing that doesn't uh, necessarily change. Well, it shouldn't change very often, at least. Um, next slide, Pedro. So what are the most important benefits? Um, a lot of these benefits will happen um, when we actually go and implement um, the reference architecture. And that can be done through several ways. I think Pedro will discuss it a little bit later. But in practical terms, we want to be able to avoid dependencies on any specific infrastructure components. An example of that being a data store, such as MySQL. We address this by having abstractions of all the infrastructure um, access components, decoupling the infrastructure from our valuable code so we can change the infrastructure implementation with minimal effort. We'd like to be able to extend the platform by adding more features without the need to change the core components to access the data directly. Because of the stable interfaces and data abstractions from the underlying infrastructure components, it should also be possible to completely replace a core component. And this design also allows for multiple external APIs to be exposed. So besides the standard FSP IOP API that we have in Mojaloop, we can also add the ISO 20022 um, specification as well or even additional synchronous APIs without changing the core uh, of the platform. Ultimately, ultimately, we'd like to provide the foundation for a true marketplace where anyone in the community, community can contribute by adding new features or replacing discrete components. And of course, I think Pedro is gonna go more detail about that. Um, and I think, honestly, this is pretty much the, one of the most important aspects of Mojulip is to be able to support such a marketplace going forward. Thanks, Miguel. 
Yes, I fully agree that that is a key point, enabling a, a marketplace. But what is a marketplace? Um, a, a marketplace is typically a space, um, either physical or, or virtual, um, it's, it's not a new thing, where customers can find solutions to their problems, to their needs. And, and providers or sellers can find the customers um, um, that um, will, are interested in their solutions, in, in what they have to offer. So in, in, in the case of smartphone users, for example, um, iOS users can, can go to the App Store and, and find applications or games that they need. Um, and, and in the case of Android, for example, they can do exactly the same thing in Google Play. Conversely, you have the developers that are building applications and building games, and they put those develop those applications, they made them available in, in that marketplace or those marketplaces. You, you, you can think of Amazon as also a marketplace. Um, customers find the products that Amazon and its partners sell in that platform. Our case is slightly different, but the fundamentals are there. And in our case, we have an open source payments platform. Um, we have our partners that help us build that platform, and we have the adopters that use the platform. Essentially, this is an environment where offer needs to meet demand. Um, and, and recognizing that different adopters have different needs um, and different partners bring different skills to, um, um, to the marketplace and different solutions, um, it, it, it is important that this recognition of different needs of the different adopters, um, for example, how should um, um, we connect to each of the adopters' um, individual systems? Those might be different systems depending on who's adopting Modulook. And, and recognizing that different partners will have different skill sets, they will have different experience, they will have different value to add to the Modulook um, 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 community with their different strengths. This is an essential part, recognizing that there's different needs and there's different skills. And by combining all of those things into one marketplace and, and making this ecosystem, it's a very important thing. So, so this environment um, is really desirable because it, it, it creates this virtuous loop where the adopters create demand and partners meet that demand with their solutions. Um, this makes Modulup very much an open space and a very healthy space where it can grow and it can increase in value and in functionality. And it also is um, a healthy system for our partners to, to, to work on and, and, and contribute to. So this, this, is, this is the vision, this is the dream. Um, how, how do we actually get a marketplace? So the, the reference architecture not only sets out the principles that we should adopt in every step of the development process, um, and, and by this, I mean the high-level principles, not the specifics of the implementation, but it, most importantly, it shows what good design looks like from that high level. And that design was created and discussed to great detail. Uh, we've been doing this for a great part of a year, almost a year already, and and the objective is to enable the underpinnings of that healthy ecosystem where partners can trust that the foundation of the software of the platform is secure, scalable, and resilient. They can add features safely by extending the solution without having to touch or even risk breaking the core code. And they can even provide alternatives to parts of the solution by adding software or contributing to software, providing software that can replace some of the core components so long it respects the modular principles and the interfaces. And this is really simple to say. Um, this is a really powerful um, um, scenario or a really powerful um, a message. People should be able to contribute, partners should be able to contribute by adding functionality seamlessly, almost like in a plug-in style where we can add functionality to, to module loop. If I need a uh, um, FRMS solution, I can just link to the FRMS solution. There's a marketplace in module loop where we know that we have some fraud management, fraud and risk management solutions that have been approved and they have been trusted, they've been tested, they abide with the principles that the platform has and they integrate really well. So you can safely implement that as an adopter because it's going to be really easy. As a provider, 
that is, or a partner that is building um, and adding to module loop, you know what the architecture look, looks like. You know the principles that you have to respect. You know the interfaces that you need to adhere to when you're contributing software, which makes it very clear. You don't need to touch the core systems. You don't need to change anything and risk breaking those um, the, the platform. So you can add to the platform. And um, this is a very important aspect of, of a marketplace is the ability to provide, to extend the platform, to extend the solution uh, in a safe manner that does not change the platform. It's still the same platform. It still has the same values, the same principles. Um, and, and it's now adding more functionalities. It's getting more inclusive. Um, Obviously, this means that the system design cannot be super specific. We cannot have all of the components of a system tightly coupled to each other. And we must leave space for different implementations and also those additional uh, features. So it, it must be designed to be extended and complemented. This is, this is almost like the ex libris of, um, of software design. Is When we design software initially, we try to make it as efficient as possible, and we try to make our resources, the resources that we have available, as efficient as possible, which means that we're going to go as fast as, as we can to deliver the value. The problem is that often we forget that a lot of the value is over the years. It's not the first one that we deliver. Um, it is important to get one out, to get make sure that we understand that the market exists, the market fit exists, the product is, is important. People need um, the platform that we need. Um, it's a different thing to design a system to be extended and complemented. This is really not easy, especially in a distributed system. So as, as, I, as I was saying, unfortunately, we're not there. Um, our current platform and the way it's coded requires some improvements, improvements to enable that extensibility the marketplace needs. And today's structure was not built for this. It's just not the way it was built. It was not the objective to have parts changed. The structure that we have in place is efficient to do what it needs to do, this is a different thing that we're now asking of, of, of the platform. So it's missing the separation. It's missing the right abstractions that um, must be in place to support this extensibility. Well, thankfully, um, our reference architecture team already spent a lot of effort producing that design of what that new version of module loop can look like. And this does require some foundational development. It requires us to start working on the next generation platform, ideally in parallel with the work um, that obviously must continue be uh, performed on the current version. It's not gonna go away anytime soon. In a perfect world, we would have enough resources to get started with the build of this um, new generation platform. Um, that's what we would have liked to, 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 started, to start doing a couple of PIs ago. Unfortunately, that is not the case. And, as Simeon mentioned just before, this is one of the key discussions to, to have, how to fund and how to resource a new version, how to get there. Um, is it a phased approach? Is it one go? I, for one, would like very much that Modulo partners could collaborate in building this new generation Modulo platform so that we can later deliver that marketplace vision where all partners and can offer different solutions to adopters' needs. This will create that stepping stone, that initial step, where it creates that virtuous cycle, where we enable the foundation, which is going to take a bit of time. It's going to, to take a bit of development where nothing is going to be immediately available to, to, to release. Um, and after that, we will get to that place where we have that minimum, we have that foundation, which means after that, we can start adding functionalities. We can have our adopters requesting different functionalities and we can have partners contributing to the marketplace by extending what Module Loop is capable of doing. Well, this is the vision. Um, we need help. We've, we've been at this stage where we know what we have to do and how we must do it for some time. Unfortunately, we don't have enough resources to deliver this vision. So our ask is, if you are a partner that is interested 
and this vision in contributing to the foundation of this marketplace, or if you're an individual contributor, contributor that can help with coding time, please reach out because we need help to get started. And with that, we open um, the floor to any questions, which hopefully um, there's plenty of. Thank you. Again, just a reminder to all, you can either post questions in the chat, uh, Pedro, I see I have some comments there, or you can um, unmute uh, or drop your hand and I'll be happy to um, coordinate that. Hey, Pedro, this is Miller. Uh, can you give us an idea of what the timing would be for starting to move some of the reference architecture documentation into the ViewPress platform? I missed the, uh, the timing for that. It's there already. So we have it. It's, um, as, as mentioned, you know that the, the reference architecture documentation is not, is not static. So it, we're adding it, we're changing it. The vast majority, I, I don't know a number, but the vast majority of it is there already. So it's available in this link that we're going to, to share. A, if, if we split the bounded context between the valuable bounded context or the, the ones that support business cases, pretty much all of them are there already and um, reviewed. We do have some of the um, cross-cutting concerns that need to be finalized and then um, transformed and documented in, in, a, in a good way for consumption as we have for the rest of it. So the answer is, it's there already, um, it's available. We're going to, to share that, uh, that link. And then a second quick follow-up to that, uh, then, then the upcoming PI then would focus on what I think of as design which is the taking of the reference architecture and the rendering of plans to build it. Is that correct or are we not quite there yet? Sorry, can you, can you repeat the question? I, 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 yeah, I'm I, sorry that we're moving from, uh, the next PI will focus on the rendering of design from these reference architecture uh, uh, documents that is a design to build. Is that correct or are we not quite at that point yet? You have a working document here, I see, but I'm not sure exactly what state that's in for des uh, yeah. the, the design build. Th that's a good point. Actually, we do already have um, that laid out. We have a specific design that we would like to implement as the foundation, and we have a phased approach that we would like to get started with. The first phase will be an alpha phase, and, and this is the foundational part. This is what we've been calling the breaking changes, essentially is recreating, obviously reusing as much as possible. Uh, and there's plenty that, that we can reuse. So it's not going to be a, a, a huge effort, but essentially is creating that foundational structure that deliver, delivers all of these principles and the separation that we have envisioned in the reference architecture so that we have the different parts of the platform separated from each other and interfacing with each other with the interfaces that we have described. So that's the first phase where the interfaces will be there, the foundation will be there, things like um, the, the security principles, the logging principles, the auditing principles. So the cross-cutting concerns, some of the reporting principles, those things will be there, but most importantly, the software is going to be separated in the different bounded contexts that implement the interfaces that we have designed. Now, at the end of that alpha release, when you look at the internals of the bounded context, they're not going to deliver production code at all. Uh, probably we will have a couple of happy path use cases just to make sure that the design that we have is, is good. The objective of this alpha release is, is not to be usable from the adopter's perspective. It is to be usable from the developers and the partner's perspectives. The point is, once we release that alpha version, developers can start changing their modules, their plugins, their contributions to the new version of the, of the architecture because the interfaces will be there. So essentially, it's giving an opportunity for um, development of new modules, new functionalities to start before we release the final version of the V2 platform. And this is a super important thing because if we can have those two things in parallel, we are going to compress the time um, that it takes to have a proper uh, version two platform that it actually works with all of the features. 
That's great. Thank you for, for that. Uh, there's a note from Douglas Jackson in the chat that uh, indicated that this appears to be a change from how we were proceeding during the previous PI that reported out in April. And in, in this case, he's making the point that there was a lot of discussion then about factoring the current architecture around the integration of Tiger Beetle. And while he's saying this, this looks like that's been scrapped, I know that that's not the case, but that what we're looking at now is a more consolidated view of how you move from a complete reference architecture to a design for a complete change to the system, not just looking at particular areas of it. That was a particularly important part that we had to go somewhat deep on early on in order to make sure we were on track. But as I understand, and perhaps you folks could speak to, I know maybe Joran's on here, uh, as to progress made in parallel and thinking about how Tiger Beetle be integrated into this new architecture. Yeah, so, so before Joran takes us to that, I, I, that's a very important clarification, Miller. And, and yes, the answer to that is no, it has not been scraped. Um, what we've been presenting is a common way or is, is, is that enabler, that design that needs to be put in place so that the marketplace can be in there. It's not just because of the marketplace, it's because of the fundamental ability for us to have different parts of the system being even replaced. Tiger Beetle is one of such examples. The design that we have can be um, put in place so that in the future, Tiger Beetle actually is swaps two parts, I'm not gonna go into the details, but we have two different parts of our system today. One part that takes care of transfers, the other part takes care of the ledger. And those two parts have interfaces and they send messages to the rest of the system. The design that we have allows us to, in the future, put Tiger Beetle in there, take those two parts, and then Tiger Beetle as a solution, as a bounded context, is going to implement exactly those same interfaces. So effectively, we take two parts of the core, we put another part of the core that does the function of those two parts and everything works. And this is super powerful. It's not just for the replacing of core components, it's also to the extensibility. So if we can, if we wanna add different ways of notifying our partners for something that happened, or as, as I um, gave the example in the previous sessions, or we gave the example in the previous sessions, add fraud and, 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 and detection mechanisms. That's great. Thank you for that. I'm going to turn it over to whoever wants to go next here. And I hope, uh, Douglas, hope that was somewhat clarifying and would certainly encourage you to uh, engage with us uh, during the week here on, on the, the current development work around the architecture. Uh, just, just to add on something there. So, so Douglas, just keep in mind what the reference architecture is. It is technology agnostic. The reference architecture does not stipulate we are using MySQL, we're using Tiger Beetle. It does not do those things. It, it describes how, we, how, how components, how our bounded context interact with each other, and, and it describes the interface contracts, right? And, and basically, we have that mapped out. And as Pedro said, we can then swap those components, et cetera, when we implement them and decide on the technologies. And of course, Tiger Beetle is one of those technologies we would definitely, I think we're all very interested in seeing how best to leverage. Yes, I don't know, Joran, do you have time to update us a bit on the Tiger Beetle, as, as Miller suggested? Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Pedro. Uh, just to check, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, is my mic coming through fine? Okay, great. Yeah, thank, thanks to everyone. Pedro, Michael, Miguel, uh, great presentation. Really excited to see the reference architecture, architecture coming, coming together. Looks great. Uh, so just as Miller said, I can uh, give everybody a short little update on um, the parallel work that's been going into Tiger Beetle. And um, <clears throat> basically, uh, if you don't know what Tiger Beetle is, um, it's not so much a technology, it's just an idea. Um, it's a technology as well, but, but the big idea behind Tiger Beetle is that um, systems like Mojo Loop or, or any payment system that, that does financial transactions, uh, the domain is really financial system of record. Um, so we need <clears throat> we need something that's more than just a MySQL database, which can offer consistency, but we need something that can give financial consistency. So how do we model our domain as a financial system of record? How do we, what is our chart of accounts? You know, we, we all used to working with SQL tables. Uh, we designed SQL schemas, columns, 
uh, rows. Uh, but how do we look at things as a financial system? Uh, what is our chart of accounts like? What are the accounts involved as, as payments flow through the system? Uh, what are the transfers involved? Uh, so this is kind of like a orthogonal design process or, or architectural process. What you know to to the reference architecture, which is looking at more the technological components and how do we abstract those. So the financial system of record is is a huge part of that. Um, and basically, what we've done is we've ex extracted some of that from central ledger. Um, so we've seen that Mojo Loop is really a two phase switch. Uh, because it's doing prepares and fulfills. Mojuloop isn't a one-phase uh, system. It, uh, two phases is at the heart of Mojuloop. Uh, so, so therefore, what we've done with Tiger Beetle is we said, right, these two big ideas, financial system of record, uh, we need to process these two-phase commit payments. Um, instead of trying to hack together a whole lot of SQL stuff, let's make this all first class as a database for high performance and high availability. Um, and let's actually go for financial system of record with two-phase ledger transactions. Um, so that's where we're at. Uh, and in terms of development, we've got the automated leader election already working. We've got a $20,000 bug bounty challenge for that. Um, um, so we've invited a lot of distributed systems people to come through and break it. Uh, so far, no one has succeeded. Uh, and we're busy basically getting our production release ready for early next year. Um, and it's been quite amazing testing Tiger Beetle. Uh, we, what we're doing is we're running a cluster of the Tiger Beetle database. It's a, so it's a financial database, uh, five, five different machines. And we're actually allowing uh, radioactively high levels of corruption on each, each machine. So like 20 to 30% of storage corruption on all machines in the database cluster. And Tiger Beetle just keeps on running and there's no financial transactions that get lost. Uh, just one, one more thing, I don't, I just to come into land, uh, something that's been really interesting in terms of just while we've been speccing speaking out the actual implementation, um, how, to, how to bring that back to uh, reference architecture uh, is just this idea again, like two-phase transfer. Um, and what's core to that is really the timeout. And this is like a little detail that I've, I've never seen before, um, but we actually made some big changes to Tiger Beetle to really do this properly. Um, because what's really critical, if someone starts a, a payment through Mojo Loop, either the payment must succeed or it must get rolled back. Uh, it, can't, it can't kind of be lost in the middle. So if the two-phase protocol fails, we need a timeout that's reliable. Um, and actually it's, it's pretty hard to do that if, if you're running on a cluster of machines, you know, or you've got a lot of Node.js processes, because now you have questions like, how do we keep, keep our clocks in sync uh, to roll these transfers back? Um, so again, this is just where having a first class two-phase ledger really helps because uh, this is now something that Tiger Beetle can do. Uh, so we've, we've actually gone and put uh, clock synchronization checks into Tiger Beetle um, at the consensus layer so that we can just make sure, you know, if, even if NTP stops working, um, you're not going to have any liquidity tied up. Uh, so that was just, just a tiny little detail. But I'll put it in the chat if you want to see more progress, uh, tigerbeetle.com. Um, that's where we're at now. And just really excited to see the reference architecture and how we'll um, integrate that with the financial system of record, the chart of accounts. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks, John. That's super exciting news. And, and you, you, you mentioned one point that is, is, um, is obviously um, coincidental with what we've been designing you know that because you've, you've been also there but the 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 design for resiliency um knowing that systems fail that parts of the system fail is something that we've been um incorporating in this reference architecture so tiger beetle is 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 excellent in that approach and the technical ability of surviving failures. And, and uh, uh, we've seen the design for that is really amazing and really impressive. Uh, what we've been do doing on the reference architecture side for that is acknowledging that fact. The distributed systems fail and they fail more than monolithic systems. That's just a statistical truth. It, it happens. So what we have in our design is the ability to withstand failures. We know failures happen. We model those failures. We recognize those failures when we make the system um, know how to behave in case of those failures. The decoupling 
is something that typically happens with that, uh, helps um, and th that ability. The design that we have, that hopefully we can implement as soon as possible for that version two, allows different parts of the system to carry on working, even if some of the system is down for whatever reason, because we're decoupling the parts. We're saying that if you cannot log in in the system, if you already have logged in, you can still work. We're saying that if the transfers, uh, sorry, if the quoting, for example, is down, the transfer is working and the lookup is working. If some other part of the system is not working as it should or it's slower, it's not going to affect the rest of the system. And this is super important. And it's not easy to design. Um, I think we've been brushing through all of these things, saying that these are necessities and these are abilities that we can deliver. Uh, and I hope that we, we're not making it sound easy. It is not easy. It is super difficult. But we do have a design that can deliver that. So we're really excited that we can start building on it. And if, if there's no more questions, I would like to, 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 to finish by, again, asking for contribution. I, I really have this dream that we can create the healthy marketplace environment. But for that to happen, we need to get there. We need, we need that foundational work to be, um, to be put in place. And that takes effort. It's not something that we can quickly do. It takes a bit of time. And I really hope that we can have partners, we can have people contributing to this um, development um, effort that is not going to be visible immediately, but it's absolutely necessary. Uh, a quick question, please. So you mentioned resilience a number of times and principles. So are those sort of like architecture principles? For example, when you said the system should be resilient, do you explain the implications of a resilient system? If you have a system of record, do you provide a bit of a view of how that should be implemented in that reference architecture? Yes. So, so the... The, the principles and the abilities are slightly different things. So the abilities is, and it's the illities as, as we tend to, to, to call them, right? It's the scalability, the resiliency, the observability, the, all of those things. In terms of resiliency, what we have is we have a fully distributed system. Um, what it means is that we don't have a single point of failure. Everything is duplicated. There is no component that exists alone. Those components talk to events making sure that the different parts of the system can work at different speeds and they can work irrespective of the other parts of the system. Now, this is not something that we can take 100% um, uh, like this. Obviously, there's parts of the system that are critical. Um, our system is not going to be very usable if the transfers part is not working. What we mean by this is that the way that we have designed things means that the transfers work alone. The transfers system, the bounded context, and its implementation has to work without anything else on the outside. If everything else fails, transfers must work. Obviously, there are things like auditing and uh, security that always have to be there. The messaging infrastructure has to be there. But the design that we have is a design where we communicate asynchronously. We don't assume that the other service is there. We don't do chain calls, so service A does not call service B and then service B call service C. We don't do that. We use a uh, orchestration and a saga um, choreography way of doing the event-driven architecture. And we've been, we're, we're using all of these principles that frankly, we, we didn't invent them. We're just copying them for the best practices and, and pretty much every big distributed system with that effort of making sure that the system is as resilient as possible knowing that it's never going to be foolproof, but we, we, we know we can make it very resilient. Thank you. So maybe just to be clear, so what I'm trying to ask is the structure of how you present that principle. If you go to the old trusted TOGAF, you have a structure for presenting uh, an architecture principle, which talks about, for example, the statement, the rationale, the implications. I'm going to tell some of this, I'm going to be resilient, what are the implications in terms of the cost of running that system and sometimes the regulation within that country? So do you provide a bit of guidance on how you transfer from the principle to the actual implementation? 
Yes, and, 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 and that's the design that we have in the reference architecture documentation. That, that's actually a good point that you, that you, that you make, the, the how to get there. We do have, um, we have a POC um, that we executed a few PIs back. And that POC essentially was focused around performance and scalability. What we did at that moment was we used these um, orchestration um, mechanisms, uh, sorry, the choreography way of doing event-driven. We distributed the system as we are proposing now. Um, obviously, we learned something from that so that we have made it better with this design. But essentially, I don't know how that was eight months ago or nine months ago already. We went, took the system, we broke it into multiple parts. We made the single responsive, we applied the single responsibility principle, which means that we had a part of the system that took care of transfers, a part of the system that took care of the participants. We distributed those parts, making sure that they don't talk directly to each other and that they can survive failures and they can have no single points of, response, of, of, um, of failure. And then we then hit it as much as possible with load. The interesting thing is that we not only increase the ability that the system has to, to handle scale, um, essentially we went from around 900 requests per second in the design that we started with to around 6,000 requests per second with the new design and also a good hopeful, a good hope, hope uh, good, a very good message, which is we can even add more by adding more machines, by adding more hardware, we could make the system faster. Plus, there was plenty of learnings from that exercise to make it faster and cheaper. And that's the cheap, the cheap part is the other point that I'd like to mention. The POC that we run actually proved that not only we can make the system more resilient, faster, the latencies of requests went down, the ability to handle more load went up, and the cost went down. I know this sounds like I'm selling sand in the desert or, or a dream, but we do have a huge document and the code and the tests and the scientific methods that we use to prove this point that actually help us. So we are in the right track and we do have that um, implementation that exists um, that guided us obviously in the reference architecture work. So we already Thanks. did it in, 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 in some way. It, we have code for that. Thank you. I'd be happy to have a look at some of that stuff. Thank you. I'm actually uh, attempting to get a link to the previous presentations where that was discussed. As soon as, as soon as I have that, I'll put that in the chat. And th th that's a good point, Miguel. Unfortunately, we, we, we cannot put everything again in the same presentation. So this presentation, we chose to focus uh, our message slightly different because, because those things were, were there in the previous documentation. So, I think that what I'm going to do is um, we're going to put those those links as Miguel is suggesting here, so that we can so that everyone can consult them because that's valuable information that complements this presentation today. Any other questions? Right. I know we're running out of time. Well, that's it then. Thank you, everyone, and uh, I hope you can contribute to this effort of building the foundation for the next generation of the modular platform.